Hey guys. So, you know those pictures that became super popular a few years ago? Uh, they're like two-dimensional images that have this random pattern of colors and shapes on them. And most people, when they look at them, they start looking at them, they only see this random two-dimensional series of colors. It makes no sense. But then they're called stereograms. Some people, when they look at them, they actually see a hidden image, a three-dimensional image in the stereogram, in the picture. You ever seen these things? So they drive me crazy <laughs> because years ago, I, I'm staring, I, I'm like, I can't see it. I can't see it. And when someone gets it and you don't get it, it's horrible. They're like, whoa, <laughs> it's amazing. It's an eagle. It's whatever. Like I, I just see ra like ran random colors. It just drives me crazy. The reason I bring up stereograms is uh, that's what this message is. This, I, I, I wish I could get you to see with Jesus' vision what we're going to talk about today. Some people, you're going to have my experience in this message, like my two-dimensional stereogram. You're going to see a few points, random colors and shapes, and it's not going to mean too much. Other people are going to be so moved by the Holy Spirit that God will take away the blinders. You will see as Jesus sees. You'll see the three-dimensional image that is deeper and farther, and God will move you. I pray that for our church, that we are moved to see deeper the three-dimensional desire that God has for our city. So we're in a series right now, it's on generosity, but not about money. We're talking about time. And so we're talking about the fact that we talked two weeks ago, are you generous with your time? Are you interruptible? We're talking, calling it interrupted. Do you see interruptions in your world sometimes as God revealing his master plan for your life? It was not an inconvenience, not a disruption. It was a revelation. God revealed this new opportunity, this chance to minister in his name. Are you generous with your time and interruptions? Last week, we talked about, are you generous with our church? Are you generous with our church? And the best expression of that, we saw Acts chapter 2, are people who gather in smaller groups. We call them grace groups here at Grace or like our short-term Bible studies or our huddles that read through the Bible throughout a year. But are you engaging with the church, supporting and growing with other people, generous with your time, and you're growing and benefiting other people as well? This week is are you generous with our city? Being generous with our city. Now, our city, the greater Kansas City area, has roughly 2.5 million people. 2.5 million people. Are you generous because the Holy Spirit moves you generous with our city. When I think about the topic of, of looking at our city, you know, I do, how do you see our city? Some of us, we see our city like the stereogram image, image like two-dimensional, the colors, the shapes, almost like when you take it off from a plane, you see the houses down there. Others, God has given you a larger, deeper vision of the needs in our city. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 19. You can write down Luke 19, verse 41 and 42. Jesus, when he drew near Jerusalem, he revealed how he looks at cities. How did he look at Jerusalem? So he's drawing near the city. He's on the Mount of Olives, a panorama view. It's like every picture of Jerusalem has this image, this view. Instead of like taking pictures like we would do today, he broke down. He saw the spiritual needs of the city. And listen to the words. Listen to the words that Jesus utters as he's crying. One of the three times in Scripture that Jesus himself personally cries an individual, a city, and the world. This is the city moment. Jesus says this, if you had known, talking about the city, if the city had known the things which make for your peace, but now, the peace of God, they are hidden from your eyes. See, Jesus, when he looks at a city, he sees a life of peace that everybody can experience, a life connected to him. And because people are missing out, it, they are blinded, it is hidden from their eyes. He is broken for that. And I long to look at our city, the greater Kansas City area, on a consistent basis with the brokenness of the Holy Spirit, the brokenness of Jesus Christ. I long for you to not just see the houses and the stadiums and the soccer fields and the schools, but to see the people's needs in there, the brokenness, the peace that they are missing out on. They're missing out. I long for that for you and for me. So would you pray with me? Would you pray right now? Pray, dear God. Let's beg God. So let's get the three-dimensional vision of what he has for our city. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. Hear my prayer. Hear our prayer. 
as we pray for our city right now. We pray, God, you would open up our eyes, the eyes of God's people, the eyes of those who have the Holy Spirit of God, that have Christ as Savior, to see the city as you see it and be broken. God, I pray you'd give us the gift of your vision, your prayer, and your tears for the people in our city who are missing out on the peace of God. God, may that break our heart. May your Holy Spirit share your brokenness with ours and help us to be lights, to be incredibly generous with our time toward our city. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 is talking about a city. Uh, and I'm like, I want you to hang on with me. i got to do a bit of history, <laughs> a bit of context to set up what is going on here in Jeremiah 29. You can join me there. So let me tell you a bit of the history of Israel. Israel was once slaves. They were once in slavery in Egypt. God sent Moses, miraculously delivered them, took them through the wandering. Now they're in the promised land. They are God's people. But because they became strong, they became arrogant, they drifted from God. God kept sending prophet after prophet, come back to me, come back to me. And finally, when God's patience had had it, he allowed three deportations. Three times Israel was defeated. And those three deportations, this Jeremiah, Jeremiah lived through all of them. What a horrible time. But he's a prophet of God speaking to God's people. If you want to write them down, the first deportation happened in 606 B.C. 606 B.C., this is the deportation they had Daniel, the prophet Daniel. Daniel, lion's den Daniel. He was taken away with people in 606 B.C., and Israel still didn't listen. Eleven years later, the prophet Ezekiel was taken away with a second group of Jews, some 10,000 Jews. Ezekiel was taken away, uh, and they're still not listening. And so Jeremiah writes, Jeremiah 29, in this section. Because 11 years after that, when God's patience had finally run thin, they're taken over a third time, they're deported. But this time, the entire city sacked, destroyed, the temple is burned. And that's where Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, the, the devastation about the destruction of God's people. So Jeremiah 29 is when the city of Jerusalem has had two separate deportations. God's people are still arrogant. They're, I can't believe they're still not listening. You see this in people's lives sometimes, like bad things are happening. They're not, not listening to God. They're still not listening to God. And so Jeremiah's preaching because they're still arrogant. The, te the temple's okay. The city's okay. We're going to come back. And Jeremiah says, that's not what God is saying. Jeremiah 29, we're going to take this in three sections right here. He's going to talk about people caring for their city, for the city of Babylon, the people, the evil people that hurt them, caring for that city. The evil pe people that they're uh, in slavery with. Those people. So we're going to take this in three sections. Jeremiah 29. First of all, verse 4 through 9. God is speaking to Jeremiah, who's still in Jerusalem, still intact. Speaking to the exiles hundreds of miles away in Babylon, telling them, even though those people are evil and they hurt you deeply, you need to be there for the peace of the city. Be generous with the city, the evil city that's around you. And by the way, our key verse is verse 7. So we're going to start off with God's main message to the exiles. Verses 4 through 6. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 6 says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. That's God's message through Jeremiah back in Jerusalem telling the exiles, lock in. You're about to bless the city and grow while you're there even among those people who hurt you deeply, those pagans who don't follow the true God. Our key verse is verse 7, the very next verse. We'll come back to it. It says this, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, Babylon's peace, you will have peace. That's our key verse. We'll come back to that. Let's continue on. Verses 8, and 8 to 9 is God's warning to the exiles. He's warning them, you guys are being deceived. Deceived into thinking that God does not want you to help that city around you. 
Look what he says. Verse 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. God speaks through Jeremiah. He says, hey, I'm the one. God says, I'm the one who caused you to be taken into captivity. Sometimes God does allow discipline in your life. Hebrews 12 says, if you're a child of God and you disobey God consistently, you don't listen to the Holy Spirit of God, you don't listen to the Word of God, He will let bad things happen in your life. Hard times. God Himself will let discipline happen in your life. Have you ever experienced the discipline of a loving God the Father? If you have not, Hebrews 12 says you ought to question whether God is actually your father because good parents care for their kids. Good parents discipline their kids. And if you're God's kid, he'll take care of you. He'll guide you. These are God's children. And so this next section in verses 10 and 11, God speaks of the future. This is the prophecy of the 70 years. You're going to be there for 70 years. This is the prophecy that the prophet Daniel, when Daniel got a hold of Jeremiah's writings, he realized we're going to be here for 70 years. There's also the location of of a coffee mug verse. You know the Christian coffee mug verses? The verses they put on Christian t-shirt verses? This is a classic Christian coffee mug verse that's misinterpreted, but we'll see why. It does apply to us spiritually, but not directly. Look what it says here. It says in uh, Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I, here is coffee mug mug verse, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Yeah, some of you are thinking, hey, I've got a painted sign in my house. (laughs) I've got a Christian bookstore with that very verse on it. What do you mean it didn't apply directly to me? So look back here. He says in verse, verse 9, this is the prophecy of the 70 years. And if you want to go a bit deeper into this, you know, write down and check out later on, check out Leviticus 25 and 2 Chronicles 36. Leviticus 25, 2 Chronicles 36. God says in Leviticus 25 that Israel, God's people, were supposed to let their land, their fields, lie fallow every seven years. So every seven days, they're supposed to have a Sabbath with no work for 24 hours. Every seven years... They let their field lie fallow. They wouldn't plant anything, not turn anything, just let it alone. And the the land would have rest. And they promptly ignored that. (laughs) For decade after decade after decade, they planted, planted, planted. Why? Because they wanted food, because they didn't trust God, because they were greedy, all sorts of reasons. Well, God says these 70 years, if you look at 2 Chronicles 36, those 70 years, he's getting back his, his rest for the land. I'm going to take 70 straight years. You're not going to plant anything. I'm going to have the land rest. God's reclaiming his, his Sabbath, the disobedience of the people. And the coffee mug verse doesn't apply to you directly, or doesn't apply to me directly. He's talking to the people that are refugees or exiles in slavery. And he says, when you stay there 70 years, remember, if you're a Jew in Babylon... I have thoughts of peace, thoughts of future, and a hope. It's directly to Jews who are living in modern-day Iraq. Now, spiritually, does it apply to God's people? Of course, spiritually, it applies to us, but not directly. It's, first of all, to them. You don't have to go out and burn your, you know, break your coffee mugs and burn your bumper stickers and burn your signs. It's still a great verse. Okay, let's look at this last section here, verse 16 to 19. God is now speaking to the Jews that are left behind with him. So remember, Jeremiah is in Jerusalem between the second and third exile. It's still an intact city, intact uh, intact temple. Uh, Jeremiah is going to hear a message for the exiles. And the exiles, the message is this. You're still not listening. We've had two deportations. Three bad things are coming because you're still not listening. God's going to allow more difficult things to get your attention. Verse 19, uh, verse 16 says this. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king who sits on the throne of David. Now, they still had a king intact in Jerusalem. Concerning all the people who dwell in this city, Jerusalem, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you into captivity, the remnant left behind. They they weren't left behind because they were better. They just were left behind. Verse 18. 
and I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence. And I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Here's why, verse 19. Because they, the remnant left in Jerusalem after two deportations, because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord. He basically says, guys, I have sent prophet after prophet to you. You didn't listen. I let one deportation. Daniel didn't listen. Another one, Ezekiel 10,000, didn't listen. I don't know what else I can do. You are not listening. You are my people. I love you too much. Sword, famine, pestilence is coming to try to bring your heart back to me. Okay, that's the story. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem with the remnant still not listening. Exiles are being told lies that they would return before the 70 years. God says to build. Let's go back and look at this key verse. When I think about generosity to our city, do you see our city the way that Jesus sees it? Am I seeing our city, the greater Kansas City area, the way Jesus sees it? Back to our key verses, verse 7. It says, And seek the peace of the city, where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. Now, if someone's out there, they're probably thinking, hey, Tim, does, that doesn't directly apply to us either. And you're right. <laughs> this actually directly applies to the Jews in Babylon. But I'm going to show you from the New Testament, every one of these concepts do apply to you and me. This is a picture of what God ha has for you and for me when we're surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God. I have three phrases in here, three things that jump off the page for me. They remind you of New Testament principles that is God's heart that when you follow him, you'll, you'll be doing these things too. You'll have a passion for these. You're going to see beyond the two-dimensional stereogram to see the depth, the wow factor of what God intends. The first phrase I want to point out is this phrase in Jeremiah 29, 7. The peace of the city. The peace of the city. The peace is, I guess it's two levels. There's, there's a physical peace where people are not fighting, absolutely. But I think God's talking not just that, on a deeper level. Spiritual peace. He's talking about the spiritual state of the city. and says God's people should be passionate about the city around them being at peace physically, but also at peace with God spiritually, at peace with their life. And for me, this, this reminds me of, do you see the city through Jesus' eyes? It's about seeing the city through Jesus' eyes. When you look at our city, what do you see? I do think there are people out here, and I'm guilty of it as well. We see the city, or like a city, like I see the stereogram. Pictures, images, we see schools, soccer fields, we see ball fields, we see businesses, we see roads, we see highways, we see I-435, we see Truman Sports Complex, we see downtown, we see midtown. We, we see these areas of the city. When Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he saw all the neighborhoods, but he was broken over the spiritual state. Do you see the peace that's lacking in our city? Greater Kansas City is not at peace. They're not living with the Prince of Peace. When, when Jesus sees the city, I wonder what he sees. John 4, 35, this is his comment to his disciples about seeing things spiritually, not just physically. John 4, 35, here's what he tells us, our, our disciples. Do you not say there, for, there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. Talking about people. For they are already white for harvest. Jesus told his apostles, his disciples, when you look at people, realize it's like harvest fields. And there are people out there, they have needs, they don't have peace. They are ready for God to harvest them. God wants to use you as a harvester. You as a broken person to go out and weep. Your tears are the watering the fields. The word of God is, the Bible is the seeds. And there are people around you who need Christ. When Jesus sees the city, I wonder how he sees it. When he sees schools, we see great schools. What does Jesus see when he looks at the schools in the greater Kansas City area? He sees top-notch schools. And he sees schools that some of our parents would never let their kids go to. Never. We would never let our kids go to. When Jesus looks in schools, he sees bullying. He sees drugs. He sees people going through terrible identity crises. In some cases, 
like fostered by their peers, some gets fostered by the educational system. He sees sexual sins. He sees the needs in our schools. When we look at homes, what do we see? We see parade of homes. We see, uh, you know, nice painted houses, manicured lawns, you know, those things. All, hey, all great things, things I'm a part of, you're a part of as well. When Jesus sees homes, he sees beyond how it looks. He sees division. He sees sadness. He sees divorce. He sees addiction. He sees single parents trying to slug it out on their own. He sees those with individuals with special needs who are longing for some hope around them. He sees, he sees parents who have made idols out of their kids. Kid idolatry. Kidolatry. He sees kidolaters in our community. When he looks at our, our communities, you know what he sees? In the old days, we had to go take the mission field. We had to take like uh, ships or planes to go on mission field around the world. You know what God sees when he sees our city? He sees that God has brought Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus to be our neighbors. That we can be global missionaries right in our city with people who are Buddhist, Hindus, Muslims, atheists, brought from around the world here. So we can be missionaries around the world. When Jesus looks at our city, he sees individuals, people who are single, loneliness. He sees emptiness. He sees addiction. He sees people with this relentless pursuit of more, a more that will never satisfy them. He sees hunger, poverty, homelessness, injustice, greed. He sees kids languishing in foster care. He sees people languishing in prisons. He sees all the stuff is empty and vain without him. Do you see our city the way Jesus sees? I've asked you a couple times. I guess I've, I did not ask you. I'm asking now. I've offered to you uh, a driving tour called Dividing Lines. Dividing Lines, I, I put the, it, the link is in our, in, in our message notes this week. If you just type, type in Dividing Lines, Kansas City, Driving Tour, it's a 90-minute driving tour of Kansas City. If you do that, your phone will guide you. It's a safe tour. You're going to hear stories. Your phone will be prompted the course of time, and you're going to see part of the history of Kansas City and the brokenness and the heartache and the hurt that maybe some of our people in our church community have not seen, have never realized, don't know the history. I'm asking every single gracer to take that driving tour and ask God to reveal how he sees our city. When you go through the neighborhoods, by the way, just ask yourself this question. What if I lived here? Would I care now? It's about, first of all, seeing, seeing the city like Jesus sees. Let's go back to Jeremiah 29.7. Uh, you talk about the peace of the city. Uh, there's a second phrase that jumps out in Jeremiah 20, 29 verse 7. And it says this comment that Jesus, or that God inspires to Jeremiah, pray to the Lord for it. Pray for the peace of the city. I'm just going to ask you, are you praying for our city from time to time? Are you begging God for the peace of the city, the blindness in our city, for like social ills to be addressed by God, for God to do amazing things, to give people help where they're at, but to God to take away the blinders so they can see Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose for them. When's the last time you just prayed for God to bring revival to our city? Like from time to time we sing it in our church, and that's great because that's a form of praying. You can say, then... But you personally, praying for revival in our city. I'm reminded of a section in 1 Timothy chapter 2. God calls us, calls you and me to pray for our government, pray for our leaders, pray for society, to have a level of peace so the gospel can go out. This is our call in the New Testament. It's 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 2. And then verse 4, one, verses 1 to 2 says this, Therefore, Paul says, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, there's our praying for our president, whatever his last name is, praying for whatever party he is, praying for our president, and for all in authority. There's our governors, there's our mayors, there's our legislatures, our judiciary, praying for us, you and I praying for our government. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Verse 4, because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, in the Old Testament, God called Jeremiah to tell his people, for a city that's wicked, that had hurt them, that weren't following God, we, we need you. God wants you to pray for your city. Pray for the peace of your city. Would you pray for me? Because some of us, we've maybe never prayed for our city. Hey, no condemnation. Or it's been a long time since we prayed for our city. Why don't you pray right now with me for our city? Right now. 
pray with me. Pray, dear Jesus. Wherever you're at, just pray, dear Jesus. God, I pray for the greater Kansas City area. I pray for all 2.5 million people. I pray that, God, everyone would be helped by the gospel in their life. I pray the hungry would be fed, the homeless sheltered, people experiencing justice would find justice. I pray for people in addiction would get set free, homes would be brought back together, schools would be raised up all around the city. And I pray upon this platform of peace and justice that you are doing, God, the gospel could go out and people could have their eyes opened. I pray for all 2.5 million people, moms and dads and kids and singles, all people of every nation, tribe and tongue, God, you brought to Kansas City. God, bring the gospel. May people have a revival in this city where they come to Christ where we live our lives in love and joy that you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, I also pray, I'm gonna pray right now. I, I didn't pray. I pray for our mayor. I pray for our president. I pray for our legislature, judiciary. I pray for all of them to be out of this peaceful society for the gospel to go out. Guys, seeing our city like Jesus does and praying for our city like Jesus does. There's a third phrase back in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, the third phrase that pops out is just the word seek. And seek the peace of the city. That means take action. Like he's calling, he's calling the nation of Israel who were hurt deeply by these pagans who brought them into, into slavery, into captivity. He says, you, and I, you guys who are there, I, I know they don't follow God. I know they're wicked people. I know they hurt you. I know that they're not good people. Would you get active in working to seek their peace. Like that's getting active. So for me, this reminds me of serving our city with Jesus' light. Getting active. Serving our city. Lifting up the light of Christ. Hope for their lives today. Help for them in their lives. Hope for their future. Look what he says here over in Matthew 5, verse 16. Here's something Jesus, Jesus says. Matthew 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What is God's call on a Christian life for you and for me around the greater Kansas City area? So we gather together, we're worshiping, we're learning, we're growing, and God wants us to fan around in every sector. So some of us go out to school, some of us go to work, some of us work downtown in the uh, Johnson County area, all around the city. And wherever we scatter, we've you know, got relatives all around the city, from the Northland, Independence, Blue Springs, out to, to Lawrence. Like We fan out there, and as we go, we're doing good works as God's leading us to help people. And when we do good works, guess what? People see Jesus. They see his light. They see our good works and they glorify our Father in heaven. Are people seeing all around Kansas City, are people seeing the light of Jesus Christ through you and through us, through our good works? I've got two websites. We're going to put them on the screen, two websites. One is visitgracechurch.com slash serve day. One is visitgracechurch.com slash outreach. So visitgracechurch.com slash serve day next weekend at 930, each of our in-person campuses. We're calling everyone to gather at 930 on Sunday for a short, like 10, 15 minute service. We're going to fan out around our city. We're going to be cleaning up parks. We're going to be help helping schools. We're going to be doing prayer walks. We're going to be doing door hangers, having conversations with people. We're going to be fanning out. We're doing an experiment to serve our city next week. Do not miss it. 930, Sunday morning, gather and scatter. We're going to have our good works seen by people. And people ask us why we're doing it. We want them to glorify our dad who's in heaven. That's next week. Visit gracechurch.com slash serve day. Visit gracechurch.com slash outreach. That's where you can find 11 of our local outreach partners. We have 11 partners, which by the way, I listed each of those partners in the message notes this week with actual tangible ways that you can start serving this week. Say, I'm out of town on Sunday. I'm not in town. Have I got a deal for you? Have we got a deal for you? We got 11 partners scattered around the city. We'll put them on the screen here. 11 partners which serve in a whole variety of sectors all around our city. Like when you get involved, there are poor, people who are poor in our city and homeless. Having gracers, can you imagine gracers showing up at our urban core? Showing up in some of, some of our, our section, uh, a different section, 11 housing that we're supporting, uh, apartments around the city. Why are you here? We're here because Jesus loves you. 
People involved in addiction, some of these ministries minister to those in addiction where they have no judgment, they have hope, they have support getting out of that lifestyle. We have people who are uh, individuals with special needs in their households that are dying for some people to support them. One of our ministries helps you to learn how to relate to your Muslim neighbors. You take a class. You start having conversations. One of those ministries support pastors and churches around the country. Our ministries take you into the urban core, help those with unexpected pregnancies, those who are orphans, orphans languishing in our foster care system. Guys, God desires us to scatter, to gather together and be inspired to follow him and to scatter around the city and do good work so our, our Father is glorified. And this message, it's a stereogram. Because there are people right now interacting with this whole message that heard some nice points, that sees some colors, but it's two-dimensional and meaningless to you because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And others, God's Spirit is helping you to see differently, to see deeper. I remember one of the advice I got with the stereogram. They said, Tim, stop looking at the picture. Look deeper, like focus beyond it. And when you focus beyond it, that's when the three-dimensional, the wow factor comes in. And when you allow God's Spirit to open your eyes, you'll focus beyond just some of these activities because they're not like taskless stuff. It's God transforming. You see the cross. You see Jesus. You see your dad transforming this city. Are you generous with our city? And if not, no condemnation. Serve day next week. Look at that list of 11 partners and say, God, do you want me to start experimenting with one of those ministries? Take that drive around our city. Say, God, give me your eyes. Would you beg God with me that we see the city the way he does? Lord Jesus, I beg you for our church. It would not be just hearing a list of like partners and things we could do. We would look beyond it to the work of the, of the Holy Spirit of God, the work of the cross, to redeem and give hope and lift up Jesus Christ all around our city. We pray for revival in our hearts, in our eyes, which would lead to revival all around our city. I pray people would give their lives to Christ as well. In Jesus' name, amen.